Well, we have made it to this second year of the More to the Story podcast, and you just heard the music that came to us from Phil Lager, who wrote that piece, the intro and the outro for this podcast. You can hear him singing More to the Story there, and several of you have gotten in touch with me who have who've enjoyed that music, and some of you picked up that he's quoting in a hymn in there. Maybe you can pick it out. Let me know if you get, if you find it. It's a kind of a fun thing. Also, I'm just so thankful for the opportunities we have to have folks who have written in kind of video testimonies where they've talked about what the podcast has meant to them in the this past year. And so I have a few more of those at the beginning of the podcast for the next few weeks. My friend Edward Williams, a former student here at Wesley Biblical Seminary, shares kind of some of his thoughts on, on the podcast. And I'm so thankful to him and his witness and the way God's using him. Also, coming out soon in July will be this course that I've developed called Contender. It's a deep look at the little book of Jude. Now, just be on the lookout for this. I'm really excited about this content and this, as Michael Green says, is burningly relevant book for our time. So be on the look for this study coming on Jude. But now here, my friend Edward. Good evening. My name is Edward Williams, and I am a proud graduate of the Wesley Biblical Seminary in Ridgeland, Mississippi. But I also happen to be a subscribed follower of Dr. Andy Miller's More to the Story podcast. Now, I wanted to hop on for just a few moments because I've tried this video like a hundred times, but I wanted to talk about one of my favorite episodes that Dr. Miller posted for us. I'm not pulling away from any of the videos that came before or after this one, but as a seminary student, this particular episode spoke volumes into my life. Um, it was called The Scripture Story with Dr. Joy Moore. Now, as a um, now graduate student of Dr. Miller's preaching class, Dr. Moore, um, I was able to meet her in Washington, D.C. this past January with some of my WBS classmates. And the same person that I saw on this podcast was the exact same person that we were able to meet in person. What I loved about this, uh, about this episode is Dr. Miller asked Dr. Moore questions about how she got into preaching, some of her preaching methods, how, how she developed as a preacher. And what I love that Dr. Moore did was she emphasized the Bible as one um, biblical narrative. And I love the way that she went into her personal bag and pulled out the movie Hunger Games. Yes, Hunger Games. And she made a cross reference between the capital in that movie with Daniel and the three Hebrew boys in the Old Testament of the Bible. And I love that because she began to show how movies attract us, how the language, how the imagery, um, in a sense, pulls out the beauty and science of preaching. And as a um, student of preaching, what better method to learn than by looking at the things that we love to watch most? Well, welcome to the More to the Story podcast. We have a great episode for you today with Dr. John Oswald, but just hold on. We're going to get there in just a second. This podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, wbs.edu, where we are training trusted leaders for faithful churches. And trusted leaders means pastoral leaders, but also people who are actively involved in their churches by teaching Sunday school or just being strong leaders in their congregations. And we think there's something important to say that we are training trusted leaders, that churches who are on the receiving receiving in of the seminary's work can trust the people who are being sent from Wesley Biblical Seminary as they are faithfully serving in their communities. Also, we have available a program coming this fall, which I want people to know about. It's called the Wesley Institute, where for nine months, we walk through every book of the Bible. So you can check that out at wbs.edu. Also, this podcast is brought, brought to you by an anonymous donor. And we are so glad today to be able to have on with the on with us, Dr. John Oswalt, who is the, a preacher, a scholar, an administrator, a well-known person in the circles that my podcast serves. So, Dr. Oswalt, we are so glad to have you with us. Thank you. Glad to be with you. So, Dr. Oswalt, what I wanted to do today is I wanted to walk through, we, often when people hear from you, and I heard from you as a boy, I, you weren't you weren't <laughs> even aware of it, but I remember you, you preaching uh, at a Salvation Army event. And it, you're one of the very first people that I came in contact with who was a scholar preacher. Now, a lot of times there's preachers and there's scholars, but people don't blend those disciplines. But it was such a blessing to me, and you were friends with my grandfather, and then it interacted with you through, uh, main, and through your writing until just recently. So it's really an honor 
to have you on the podcast today. Well, it's an honor to be with you. So a lot of times what happens is we'll maybe look at one of the areas of your scholarly focus, and that's that's a helpful thing. But I haven't heard too much where people just talk about your story. And this is the More to the Story podcast. <laughs> and I want to get a little bit more of that story. And then maybe we'll touch some of the scholarly and kind of like theological emphases that you've had through the years. But how did you feel led to become a scholar and a preacher? Well... You don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not, yeah. But uh, I grew up on a farm in okay. Ohio, and um, uh, my sister, who was 10 years older than I, brought home with her a preacher from Asbury College in those okay. days. And when I heard that guy preach, I thought to myself, boy, if I could preach like that, I think I might like to be a preacher. Okay. And uh, so I preached our cows into the kingdom pretty <laughs> regularly as I took them back and forth to the field before and after milking. Um, that was okay when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, but by the time I was 16, it was not okay. Okay. I did not want to be a preacher. And wow. so I went to Taylor University, ostensibly to play football, Okay. Uh, now, what position did you play? Guard. Did you really? Okay. <laughs> Watch out. Okay, keep going. Uh, um, and um, I went there only knowing what I would not be. Wow. So I I enrolled in a pre-law course, and uh, one of my one of my uh, ladies in the church where I grew up said to me once, Johnny, I think you might make a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd been arguing about something, but. <laughs> My, I, I met there really for the first time, sharp, gifted, committed Christian kids. Okay. And they impressed me greatly because I'd gone to church all my life. I'd been in church. Uh, my parents were deeply committed Christians. And um, so I just wanted my way and God's way, that's all. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I began to read the scriptures seriously for the first time in my life. Then in the summer of my freshman year, I went to a Bible conference in Michigan where I was a dishwasher. Okay. And uh, met a young woman who was a waitress and uh, have been meeting her ever since for Amen. 60 years. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, every week, uh, a, a great evangelist, a great missionary speaker, music, that impressed me. That fall back at Taylor, a man named Dennis Kinlaw came to preach the fall spiritual emphasis week. Okay. And I remember saying to a girl that I took to an evening meeting on a date, wow, when I hear that guy <laughs> preach, I'm not even sure I'm a Christian. Wow. Thursday of that week, I went to talk to him. Well, he didn't take 10 minutes to determine whether I was a Christian or not. He said, John, I know what your problem is. Exactly. I said, oh? He said, uh, he drew a little diagram. I don't know whether he had gotten it from uh, Campus Crusade or whether they got it from him. A circle. And in the center of the circle was a chair. And on the chair was a big capital I. And around the circle were little crosses. Hmm. He said, John, you're on the throne of your life. Wow. And you'll never, never be satisfied until Jesus is on the throne. Would you like that to happen? Mm. And I said, yeah, yeah. Well, those who knew Dr. Kinlaw know that he had a habit. When he was intense, he got right up in your face. Right. And uh, we were sitting on two chairs facing each other. He scooted out to the edge of his chair, and he looked at me. He said, John, what is there you won't do? Mm. I just mm. blurted it out. I won't be a preacher. Yeah, sure, you <laughs> knew it, yeah. And he said, well, I guess that's the end of our conversation then, isn't it? Mm. And I said, well, no, I, 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 I want <laughs> Let's talk Jesus. This. I want Jesus. He said, how can he be on the throne of your life if there's something he wants you to do and you won't do it? Wow. Yeah. So I said, okay. <laughs> okay. And, you know, you, you hear people say it, but it's true. That made all the difference. Didn't it? Yeah. The there difference. were no flashing lights. There was no thunder. There was no lightning. Uh, but as I went out of that room, I said to myself, I don't feel any different, but everything's going to be different. Mm -hmm. And it was. Amen. And that really then made all the difference. 
the brightest, sharpest kids were headed toward missionary service, and I had bought the idea that if you're not called to stay home, you better plan to go. Okay. <laughs> so I never felt a particular missionary call, but that's where I'm headed. My senior year at Taylor, I was in um, an English course. I was, a, I was a minor in English literature, and um, the professor, wonderful woman, uh, said to me, John, I'd like to talk to you after class. Hmm. I said, sure. She said, John, have you ever considered becoming a teacher? Interesting. You have a gift. I said, no, I'm going to be a missionary. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I worked this out with Dr. Kinlaw. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> About 30 years later, I was back at Taylor and met her, and she looked at me and smiled, and she said, do you remember a conversation we had? <laughs> I said, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. So I went to Asbury Seminary. And my second year at Asbury, I was taking Hebrew and loving it. I, I had really started reading through the Old Testament slowly and uh, back there at Taylor. And it was just opening windows and doors. Mm -hmm. I was saying, mm -hmm. okay, okay, I see what's going on here. So the end of my second year in seminary, first year we were married, I felt a very clear call into teaching. Okay. And I thought, well, what will I teach? Old Testament. Yeah. <laughs> and that's been the story. I, we continued to pursue missionary service. But at that point, the missions had no place for teachers. Mm. It was, you join us and we'll tell you what to do. <laughs> right. It sounds like the Salvation Army too. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and I, I, my call into teaching was just so strong that yeah. I said, no, I, I've got to do that. Gotcha. Got to do that, and that's where it was. All, all the, so, so that was a sense of like not only just teaching, but in order to be a teacher, you, you could have gone and been a, a middle school teacher, yes. which was a high vocation, right? But yes. yet, it still was a call to scholarship, yes. a call to be to be a scholar in the world, and that and then incorporated preaching at some point too. So, I, obviously, working through seminary and working then you, when you went to Asbury Seminary or with Dr. Dennis Kinlaw there, who had influenced you at Taylor, and he too is Old Testament scholar. So you went on this trajectory towards Old Testament scholarship. And that, that took you to Brandeis? Is that where you did yes. your PhD? Yes. So again, th so this then starts to come into focus. Now, now tell me a little bit, along the way, I'm sure you started preaching still <laughs> while, while teaching. Yeah, I, and, and, and I need to say there are scholars. Okay. Scholars love to learn. Mm -hmm. they, they cannot get enough. They can't go deep enough, cannot go broad enough. And then there are teachers. Okay. People who love to communicate what they've learned. Okay. I'm the latter. This is I helpful. am not I am not a scholar in that full sense. I hope I hope that indeed I study deeply. I hope that I learn deeply. But that's not what drives me. Okay. What drives me is communicating. I love this. Okay. And that really that goes back almost to my childhood. Uh I was in speech contests in high school, was a finalist in a state speech contest in Ohio. Okay. And, and was a speech and drama major at Taylor. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was preaching while I was at Taylor. Uh, and, and so you, you, you can't stop me. <laughs> yeah, I love – these are interesting distinctions. I had another person who's, who I, I called, and I said, you've been a, an intellectual within this particular discipline for 50 years, and I just love it. And he, he stopped me, and he said, well, there's intellectuals and there are academics. He says, I don't like all of the – all that comes along with the idea of being an intellectual. I've been an academic. And I love this distinction you're saying between being a scholar – and being a teacher and a communicator. Like yes. that's been the primary yes. motivation. You want, you have a truth that you want to convey. Yeah. So I love, so yeah. even yeah. your scholarly work, are you thinking as you are deep in original manuscripts and, or not, or manuscripts, dealing with them, how am I communicating this? Is that what's on yeah, your mind? Yeah, and, and how can I share this? Right. Isn't this exciting? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this ancient dead language. <laughs> so, you know, I, I love to teach Hebrew. Mm. Uh, uh, again, though, part of it simply for the people say to me, why do you teach? And I say, to watch the lights come on behind their eyes. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And you that's, suppose that's why you preach too? Yes. 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 I mean— 
Um, I, I, I depend very heavily on audience feedback. Mm. Uh, now, I, I'm, I'm not uncomfortable uh, doing media stuff. But typically, I'm really thinking as I look at that lens, I'm thinking there's a person in there that I'm talking to. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, so audience feedback means an awful lot to me. Am, mm. I, am I getting through to them? Are they responding? Are they saying yes? Yeah. Uh, so that uh, this, is, this is what drives me. Yeah, it's when I went when I was coming to sem when I left Asbury University and I was going to go to seminary. The reason I went to Asbury Theological Seminary is my wife had a year and a half left at Asbury University. That's why we <laughs> stayed there. But my grandfather was in some ways not happy with me because he wanted me to come to Wesley Biblical Seminary. Why? Because of you. And and he thought I I trust John Oswalt. I love John Oswalt. Um, just you know you mm. just. Watch what you're learning, Andy. And he kind of like, and I had a great experience at Asbury Seminary, so I don't discount that. But when I got to Asbury Seminary, here's what I heard: people, you were still like kind of talked about, uh, kind of almost myths in the hall <laughs> Probably of your myths. teaching, and like there were people who said, I, and they, they, who had been with you, what made that time when you had finished uh, at Asbury Seminary, you had been there maybe five or six years before. They said there, we gave John Oswald standing ovations after <laughs> lectures. Now is that true? Once. <laughs> Once, okay. <laughs> Once. I heard ovation, so it did become a bit of a myth. So, but you would prepare for those lectures and w w wait to see those lights come on. I think that that's kind of the integrating idea behind your work and, and your influence. And it's influence not just a holiness movement, but all, all whole groups of pastors through the years. Now, I want to get in a little bit. You went to Brandeis, and then you came back and taught at Asbury Seminary. And imagine in there your writing ministry started. And one of the, f the first ways, the prime ways people might know you, uh, pastors might know you, is through your work on Isaiah. So tell us about that. Like, what was that some of your doctoral work? And, and you have one of the most established commentaries on that in the New International Commentary in the Old Testament. And then you've done other work on Isaiah, the New International uh, Commentary series as well. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your Isaiah work? Um, I have never been able to put myself forward. Mm. I, 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 I know colleagues, students who are planning, okay, if I make this connection, I meet that, uh, this will happen. And I've never been able to do that. I don't see that as a particular <laughs> grace, but it's just, it's just who I am. I can't okay. do it. So, uh, these things have come to me by God's grace. Okay. Simply. Amen. Uh, so, um, in in the summer of 1972, I've been teaching just two years back at Asbury. I got an opportunity, and I'm not sure. I think it may have been through Dr. Kindle. I don't know, but I got an opportunity to write a large article in the revised International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, okay. uh, about 15,000 words. And uh, I wrote it and got it in on time, yeah. which I know now from my editor experience is very unusual. <laughs> 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 and I honestly think that may have been part of what <laughs> happened. But I, we were at supper in October of 1973, and the phone rang. And it was R.K. Harrison, a professor at uh, Toronto, uh, University of Toronto. And uh, he said, John, I need someone to write a two-volume commentary on Isaiah. Not a small <laughs> task. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I need it in five years. Wow. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Okay. Uh, I said, I would have to have at least 10. Wow. He said, well, let's compromise on eight. <laughs> okay. Wow. So there it was. Just eight out years. of the blue. Out of the blue. So it took me nine years to get him the first volume. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> Again, <laughs> he thought I was going to meet the schedule. Uh, but he was very, very kind about the first volume. And he said, John, you take as long as you need for the second column. Second okay. Volume. <laughs> he died waiting for the second Oh, no. Volume. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, it took me another uh, 
Well, to write it, it took me another 11 years, and then the, the uh, publisher was fairly slow. I think maybe they had maybe a number of volumes for the set came in at the same time. So it was from the time I start, got the contract in 73, it was 25 years until the second wow. volume appeared in 1998. Uh, but there it was. It was and, and so it was a gift from God. Wow. It was, it was not anything that I finagled for or designed for. It was, it was out of the blue. And so, you know, I just, to, to have spent much of my professional career uh, studying that book has been just an unbelievable gift. Mm. An unbelievable and a gift to the church too, mm. and to me personally. Mm. Just last week, mm. I was asked to go to a weekend conference and present on the armor of God. And so, as I'm doing this, you know, re realize very quickly that Paul is most likely quoting Isaiah 59. <laughs> right? God puts on the helmet yeah. of salvation, yeah. and the breastplate of righteousness. Yeah. Well, who did I go to? I mean, <laughs> two. And then on the top of that. And let me just say, the New International Commentary series, Those you can't always say like that one series is always the best, right? There's no. depending on the author. Yeah. Nevertheless, that the expectation in that series, to me, when I read it, is that this is going to have a comprehensive look, looking at all of the sources, all of the arguments, so that when you look at one chapter in Isaiah, this is a definitive piece on that that chapter, its form, its structure, its pastoral implications. So that's why this is a 25-year process, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. anyways, it, it's, it's such a blessing. In, in the New, New International Version application, application commentary, yes. too, yes. it also has a little bit different shift. Yes, it, yes. It, it is. Uh, they told us when they gave us the assignment, each paragraph that you choose, you look at it three ways. Um, what does it mean? What does it say? It, uh, I should back up and say, what does it say? That's just the grammar, that yeah, sort yeah. of thing. What does it mean? What's its theological teaching? And then how does that apply? Right, right. Now, I think that may date it uh, because applications change over time, but pastors say to me, uh, that's the one I go to because it helps me to say, okay, so yes, yeah, that's what it means. Uh, I, get, I get very concerned about seminary students who, in fact, are not preachers. They're Bible lecturers. Interesting. And that's, there is an, a, a watershed difference between those two. If you simply tell your people, that's what it says, so what? Mm. The mm. question is, what does that mean for your life? Right, right. And that's where a sermon has to address people. It has to challenge people. It has to move them. Mm. A lecture, you want to inform them. You hope to inspire them. But a sermon, no, nah, no. Nah. Yes. You got to move them. I love that. And, and here's – this is a little commercial time for me. <laughs> uh, so if anybody's interested in what Dr. Oswalt's saying, if you sign up for my email list, <laughs> I will send you uh, a – Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching. This is a little a document I've done with a 45-minute teaching, but likely some of the, and I imagine that you studied with Dr. Trena as well. Yes. And I take his <laughs> method, inductive Bible study method, and I use that in a way that's wanting to help people think while they're in the IBS method, how do they make a step toward proclamation and creatively thinking how I connect with the audience. <laughs> so you can get that at my website, and there's a link probably in the show notes here. Now I want to ask one more question about Isaiah. What is it when people think about that 25-year labor of love that you did in that text? What is the kind of big contribution that distinguishes your work in Isaiah? Is it, I know there's probably every verse there's something, but uh, and, and truly, but I mean, what distinguishes what you've done? One of the rewarding features of my life has been for the past now almost 40 years, uh, at one time, it was probably one a month, I was getting an email, email from a pastor saying, I'm preaching through Isaiah, and your book is the one that is helping me to understand what he means. Wow, wow, yeah. And I write back and say, you're the guy I wrote it for. <laughs> Amen, Amen. <laughs> to me, to me, the book of Isaiah 
is the most comprehensive statement of Old Testament theology, uh, excuse me, of biblical theology in the Bible. I say to students, if somebody comes to you and says, I'm going to take away 65 of your books and leave you one, keep Isaiah. Wow. Because there's more of the New Testament in Isaiah than any other Old Testament book, and Isaiah is the essential foundation for Christian truth. Mm. And so it's that the, the wonder of God's absolute transcendence. He's the Holy One. You see him, you fall on your face saying, it's over, I'm mm. done. And he's also the God who opens his arms to us and invites us in. Mm. Wow, I love that. That completeness, uh, which I had no idea of when I really started on the thing. You know, I was, I was as green as grass. <laughs> I was a child. And, uh, but, but just the deeper into it, the more, oh my... There's more about creation in Isaiah right. than there is in Genesis. Wow, interesting. <laughs> now I'm going to have to look into that. And also new creation for that matter, exactly, too. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and Isaiah's purpose there is to say the gods didn't create the world, mm. so they can't deliver you from the world. But the creator, mm. the one who stands outside of time and space, he can reach in and touch you and lift you out of the tragedies in which you're facing and transform you. Amen. Oh, I love it. <laughs> now, you also promote in that book the view of a single Isaiah authorship. I do. So is that something you still hold to? I do. Okay. You want to give us uh, 30 <laughs> seconds on that, which deserves three hours? <laughs> or 30. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. <sighs> the book claims to be written by Isaiah. Exactly. No yeah. other yeah. author is mentioned. Mm. We also have no extant example of anything but the whole book as it stands. So when people talk about second Isaiah or third Isaiah, they're talking about a scholarly hypothesis for which we have no objective evidence. Mm. So I think the default position is one guy wrote this. Mm. But whatever you say there, it is, I think, unquestionable that the Holy Spirit means us to read this thing together. Mm. It's mm -hmm. a unity. It's a whole. And to say, well, let's talk about the theology of 1st Isaiah, and let's talk about the theology of 3rd Isaiah. No! No! Let's talk about the theology of Isaiah. Yes, yes, yes. 56 to 66 has to be read in the context of 1 to 6. Mm. And that's even more than the technical issue of authorship. The unity of the book is what I want to drive. And in my mind, you cannot explain the unity without single authorship. Awesome. That is so helpful. And it, what is the text? asking us to do i think that's exactly like, this is what in the same exactly. thing through with the pentateuch and we could go through like the text the text is asking this of us of course we recognize that yes. in the pentateuch moses couldn't have written about his own death <laughs> right and it, like there's probably some editorial considerations yeah. to be yeah. given to yeah. isaiah yeah. as well yeah. Yeah. so okay thank you for giving me 30 seconds on that when it deserves 30 <laughs> hours so i know that, that that needs so much more time and i that, that represents like, again you were in Isaiah for 25 years <laughs> producing that one two-volume commentary. So th that's unique. Okay, I want to get into another one, and I, I also want to hit on some of, if we can get there, on some of the other uh, things you've done in your ministry. But The Bible Monks and Myths, myths mm -hmm. 2009, really important book that came out. And what tell us a little bit about what led you to write that book and why it's so important. Well— here comes Dennis Kinlaw again. <laughs> okay. I, I, hand, I sense a theme. And I, people who listen to this podcast are very used to hearing Dennis Kinlaw's name. <clears throat> I'm very grateful that I felt the call into teaching and teaching Old Testament the year before Dennis Kinlaw came to Asbury Seminary to teach. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, okay. I might have thought, well, I just got sucked into that. But no, it was there before. But I'm then very grateful that the next year he did come to teach. One of the courses he taught was entitled Literature of the Ancient Near East. And in it, <coughs> he introduced us to a book called The Religion of Ancient Israel, which is a one-volume condensation of a seven-volume original wow. <laughs> written in Israeli. Wow. <laughs> a man named Yehezkel Kaufman 
a Jewish man, and he called attention to two worldviews. There's a worldview that says this world is all there is. There's nothing outside of it, mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. cosmos. And in this cosmos, everything in it is continuous with everything else. Okay. So if I do something to this soil, I've done something to all soils. It's what lies behind voodoo. Okay. Make an image of Oswald, stick it with a pin, and you've stuck Oswald with a pin because the image and Oswald are continuous. That understanding that really there are only two worldviews, two worldviews, the biblical one and the other one. Okay. Because the biblical one says, no, God is not this world. There is something outside of this cosmos. Well, how many religions believe that? Mm. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and I don't have a Bible to wave. <laughs> they all got it from one place. Right. One single source in the history of human thought says there is something outside of this cosmos. Right. So that understanding, there is transcendence, which is the biblical view, and continuity, which is the pagan view. That shapes everything. That shapes everything. This is, again, as I said a moment ago, this is what shapes Isaiah's understanding of creation. Because there is a transcendent creator. Yes. There is the possibility of salvation. Mm. There is the possibility of deliverance. Mm. If there is no transcendent creator, then, baby, you are what you are, and you're never going to be different. Wow. Salvation becomes self-realization. Yes. <laughs> So that, that understanding of two worldviews really then has shaped my teaching and my thinking ever since. That would have been in the uh, fall of 1964. <laughs> so uh, ever since then. And, and so that book really is a distillation of my thinking that what we've got in the Bible, and, and, and the point that I make there is, are there a lot of similarities between the Bible and ancient Near Eastern literature? Sure. Yeah. God's very economical. <laughs> Anything that he can use, he will use. Yeah, sure. But that's not what defines the Bible. What defines the Bible is its differences mm -hmm. from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did they offer sacrifices? Yeah. Did the pagans offer sacrifices? Yeah. So they're doing the same thing. No, they're not. Mm. Do they have creation stories? Yes. Yes. But they're what, not the same. What distinguishes them? Yeah. The creation stories in the beginning was chaotic matter, mm. which has always existed and will always exist. Well, look at the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that stuff, Physical that's permanent. Yeah, yeah. This stuff, uh, this rots away and disappears. But that stuff, ah. Mm. So, yeah. And <laughs> we know from experience that matter hates being organized. <laughs> mm. Chaotic matter is the basis of everything. And here's the Bible that says, wow. in the beginning, God. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, with sacrifices, okay, the gods are mad at me. So let's do a ritual, and I will become this sheep, and we'll kill the sheep, and the gods will say, oh, Oswald is dead. It's okay. Ah. And the prophets say, don't you dare you sacrifice that way. Don't you dare think that you can manipulate God by giving me a sheep. Wow. Well, what are we doing then? You are representing the character of your heart. Mm. How much do I love God? Here's my very best lamb. Mm. How much do I hate sin at the cost of life itself? Mm. So they're doing the same thing, but they're not doing the same thing. Same thing with the temple. Canaanite temples, three parts. A front porch, a holy room, and an inner cell. Temple, front porch, holy place, holy of holies. Yeah. Ah, but in that inner cell is an idol. Mm. 
is a God that you can manipulate mm. by giving him sacrifices, by putting nice clothes on him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the temple is a pretty gold box. <laughs> wow. How do you worship a box? Right. You don't. Wow. You worship the one who is above that box and whose character is represented by what's in the box. Yes. Wow. Same thing? No, no. I like to say <clears throat> there are a lot of similarities between me and my dog. <laughs> we have two nostrils. We have two eyes. We have two ears. Right. We have the same circulatory system. Right. We have the same respiratory system. We have the same gastrointestinal system. So the dog and I are the same thing. <laughs> no. Right. It's not the similarities that define us. It's the differences. Yes. Oh, I love that. Thank you for distilling that down just in a couple of minutes for us. <laughs> I want to bring up one thing connected to this, and this is at the bequest of uh, our my president, Dr. Matt Ayers, but also my interest too. In the last year, William Lane Craig, Dr. William Lane Craig, has come out with his book on the historical Adam, <sighs> and he draws upon the work of you know one of your students and my one of my professors. So I guess I'm like your grandson student, <laughs> uh, this Dr. Bill Arnold, and in his commentary, his Cambridge commentary on Genesis talking about mytho history. So how does that interact with um, the, with your concepts that you're talking about even here with and, and in the Bible and the myths? I know this deserves again 30 hours. Yeah. I just acknowledge that. Yeah. And I hesitate to criticize a friend and former student. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, uh, it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Genesis is not mytho history. Okay. Uh, it is not mythicized history, which is really where Craig is taking it, that, well, goodness gracious, look at the difference between one to, Genesis 1 to 11 and Genesis 12 and following. You've got all this fantastic stuff in Genesis 1 to 11. Clearly, that's not historical. You don't have any fantastic stuff in Genesis 12 following mm. about God showing up and having supper with Abraham. Right, right. No, the different Genesis 1 to 11 is the broad, long distance uh, telephoto lens of tens of thousands of years. But it's not fundamentally different from what follows in Genesis 1 to 12. Hmm. Does, it, does it describe history using poetic language? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does it describe history using grand images? Yes. Does it condense long sweeps of history into a single episode? Yes. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's not historical. Okay. Interesting. So, like, just the fact that it's supernatural kind of moves it beyond the idea exactly. of seeing, like, it could, anything could be historical because yes. there's supernatural mm -hmm. claims— Genesis yes. 12 and following. Yes. Uh, Abraham's yes. call, for yes. that matter. So yes. but, uh, I, I mean, I, I've, I've found myself kind of wondering about William Lane Craig's kind of analysis and, and in some ways appreciating the fact that he wants to at least have a connection to a singular Adam and Eve. Like that's something that's, that's helpful to me. But he puts it in the idea of this idea of there being a certain form of literature and that, that, that the first— um, you know, yeah. primeval history yeah. is, is that literature. So, so you're saying that that challenge moves beyond maybe in the supernatural claims. And, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And and throughout the Bible, theology is rooted in real human historical experience, in real time and space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To say that that only starts at Genesis 12. And that Genesis 1 to 11 is not rooted in real events in time and space is to miss it. Gotcha. Miss Thank it you. for. I know that that deserves more time. So yeah. I, anybody who's listening to this and is <laughs> feeling like, oh, well, just know I'm just trying to get a little taste <laughs> of some of the things that Dr. Oswald did. And honestly, it is my curiosity, too. <laughs> I wanted to hear just a brief, and maybe we'll talk more about it later, too. Okay. So one of the other great things that happened in your career as a communicator was that you were a part of the translating committee, not just doing one book, but you were the editor for the Minor Prophets for the New All Living Translate. All the Prophets. Excuse me. So for the New Living Translation. So tell me about that, and what was that process like? I think, well, <clears throat> there was a committee of 12 persons, uh, six of us who were biblical scholars. Uh, Daniel Block was in charge of Pentateuch, 
Um, Barry Beitzel was in charge of historical books. Tremper Longman in charge of poetry. I was in charge of prophets. Um, <clears throat> Grant Osborne was in charge yeah, of sure. the um, uh, epistles and acts. And I'm not going to remember the name of the sixth one who was in charge of uh, epistles and revelation. So there were six of us. Yeah. <clears throat> then there was an English stylist. Okay. Uh, Dan Taylor, who taught for many years at Bethel. And then there were um, four representatives from Tyndale, the publisher, uh, a New Testament coordinator, an Old Testament coordinator, <coughs> Dr. Ken Taylor, who did the Living Bible, okay. and his son, Mark Taylor, who was president of Tyndale House at that point. So there were 12 of us on this committee, and we spent six years. Wow. <coughs> and all of us, particularly all of us biblical scholars or teachers or whatever, will tell you that was the high point of our professional lives. Wow. To sit around a table for eight hours discussing what does the Bible say? Wow. What does it mean? And we all, we all laugh at some of the things that we got to know each other very, very well. Yeah. Uh, we, in, in the idea in the beginning was the Living Bible has sold 40 million copies. It has been used by God in tremendous ways, but it always gets dismissed as a paraphrase. Right, right, right. Is it possible to keep the same energy, the same readability, and make it a translation? Mm. So that's where we started. The language was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If the Living Bible captures what the Greek or the Hebrew says, keep it. If okay. it doesn't, change it. So that was the whole idea. And uh, so we would... We would uh, uh, sit around that table, and oftentimes it would end up an 11 to 1 vote, and the one vote would be Kenneth Taylor. Okay, and Kenneth Taylor's original new, okay. Here we are tearing lim limbs heart. and arms off his baby. <laughs> yes. And, and he would argue, he would argue strongly for his position, but once the vote was taken, it was over. Wow. And all of us have Even his son. We'll go again. Okay. <laughs> All of us have testified again and again to the example of grace. Mm. He never, once it was over, it was over. He never pouted. He never sulked. Uh, it was always, well, if that's what you think. And so that's one of the things that impressed all of us. Uh, w again, I say we got to know each other very, very well. And sometimes we would say, well, that's the word of God by a six to five vote. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Supreme Court or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And uh, one, one time we'd had a long, long discussion and finally had taken the vote and uh, it was over. And I was sitting next to Mark Taylor, who, was, who functioned as the chairman, his, Ken Taylor's son, okay. because he was president of the company. He looked at me and said, John, what's the matter? I said, I didn't say anything. He said, no, but you sighed. Oh, <laughs> interesting. I've heard that sigh before. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it, was simply, it was simply a glorious experience. The process was, interestingly, each of the sections divides into fives. The Pentateuch, of course, five books. Yeah. But the historical books can be divided into fives. The poetry, if you take Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, excuse me, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Okay. Ezekiel, Daniel, and the 12. Okay, gotcha. Five. Sure, interesting. So in each case, we then invited three persons to go through each one of those units and offer their suggestions as to, okay, how can we correct the living Bible here? Okay. Those would then, for instance, with Jeremiah and Lamentations, those suggestions came to me. I then collated them, put them together, and prepared a, this is what it is. That was then sent to all the members of the committee, and we would then meet. Gotcha. Originally, uh, Tyndall House uh, naively thought we could do this in a few long weekends. Oh, but wow. But after the first two weekends, it was obvious that's not going to work. Let's get five more years. So they <laughs> said to us, well, suppose we take you someplace for three weeks each summer. Well, we all had young children at that point. 
And we said, mm, that won't work. Mm. They said, suppose we take you to someplace nice and bring your family with you. Well, there you go. <laughs> and we'll start work at 6.30 in the morning and finish at 3.30, and you'll have the rest of the afternoon and evening with you. We said, yep. <laughs> <There>. Deal. <laughs> so we would meet typically the first three weeks in June, and for most resorts, that's downtime. Mm -hmm. So we went to Aspen, wow. <laughs> we went to Beaver Creek, we went to Charleston, <laughs> and I, I was looking at, in one case, at the uh, thing on the back of the door of my room, and it said the normal price for this room was, I think, $485. Wow. <laughs> I think we, they, Tyndale probably got it for under 100 <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so it was, it was we, our kids grew up together, and... Uh, it was simply it was simply a marvelous experience. Oh, I love I've never heard that story yeah. or anything about I've just been one who's benefited from yeah. the NLT. Yeah. And I use yeah. it often in my kind of daily morning read oh, through I the do. Bible. I do. Okay. All the time. Well it's nice to know I'm in good company. Yes, today. you are. So it, did you do the work on Isaiah yourself yes. for that one? Okay. And it because yes. then you assigned the other ones out. No, oh. no, there were there were I was one of the three okay, gotcha. for <laughs> Isaiah. And then that was a little bit warped because then I got to make the final decision as <laughs> to what it Let would me, be. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> yeah. over Overruled. <laughs> Overruled. Uh, yeah, the editor has spoken. Yeah. That's great. Okay, now I want to transition to one other question. And some people will know that you served as the interim president here at Wesley Biblical Seminary for uh, three or four years as a president. No, pres no, no, no. Only a year. Only a year. Oh, no, here. I mean, then also as president of Asbury University for, was it three? Three and a half years. Three and a half years mm -hmm. there. And then, you know, you've served in leadership roles within the Wesleyan Holiness Movement as a whole. And, and Asbury University and Seminary, Wesley Biblical Seminary, denominations like your denomination at Free Methodist Church, the Salvation Army, et cetera, are part of this broader movement. And I'd love to just get your thoughts on where that movement is as a whole and what you see kind of happening in that world. I, I I, I, can, I think I can speak authoritatively on this, is that we see you as one of the key communicators and leaders in that movement, and we're so thankful for your homiletical direction, writing direction. But, you know, you have a vantage point that's unique because you're connected to people like Dr. Dennis Kinlaw, scholars from other generations that interact in the evangelical community as a whole. So there, I'm buttering you up a little bit. I yeah. don't mean, but it, it really <laughs> <Pretty> is. <thick. laughs> it's true. And that's why I'm so honored to have you on. But tell us a little bit about your thoughts about where the Wesleyan Holiness Movement is and where it should be going. Well, it is in deep trouble. Okay. It is in deep trouble. Um, uh, the second law of thermodynamics <laughs> says that things tend toward inertia. <laughs> and, and that's what has been happening in the holiness movement really for the past 50 or 60 years. Okay. Uh, uh, one famous writer very publicly announced the holiness movement is dead. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and he said, and I think correctly, a movement is something that has an inner cohesiveness that drives it forward and to which people can... Um, uh, they can join it without ever actually signing things. That's no longer the case. There's no longer a cohesiveness about this, quote, movement. Mm -hmm. And there's no longer a sense of forward movement. Mm. And, and that's sad. <laughs> uh, we see, and, and I'll, I'll simply say it, we see a denomination like the Nazarene Church, which was built on the doctrine of second blessing holiness, now largely, largely discarding it. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to Nazarene pastors who are grieved over what is happening on the higher levels in terms of simply abandoning the idea. Uh, that's tragic mm -hmm. because <laughs> holiness is what the Bible is about. Amen. amen. <laughs> yeah. And it is not... A, Tragically, it has been presented too often by those of us who would espouse it as demand. Mm. You know, we love Hebrews. Without holiness, no one will see God, so you better get with it. Mm. Well, that's tragic. Holiness is not a demand, it's an offer. Mm. You and I can share the character of God. Amen. 
you and I can walk with him in untroubled fellowship. Yeah. Uh, that's not a demand. That's an offer. Amen. And it's a wonderful offer. And that's why, I, I'll say it to you rather bluntly, I don't care what happens to the movement. Mm. <laughs> Amen. I care about communicating this truth. Right, right, and, right. And, and getting others to join <laughs> right. in this crusade. Uh, that's right. a that's a bad word. I love days. it. But this is not the institu- <laughs> it's not the institutional forms that are are what's the the substance of it. Instead, right, right. it's the experience, it's the doctrine, it's the reality. Yes, yes. Years ago, there used to be the Christian Holiness Association, right? Which started out as the National Holiness Camp Meeting Association, right? Right. <laughs> coming out of the great camp meetings of the late 1900s, uh, late 1800s. Uh, I was at the last commission meeting, and the question was asked to these, there were probably 35 of us in the room, mostly denominational leaders. The question was asked, what can the Christian Holiness Association do for you? Mm. One after another, they said, well, really, nothing. Mm. And I have thought ever since that was absolutely the wrong question. The question is, what can we as a united group do to spread the good news of holiness? Right, sure. <laughs> so that it was all framed in terms of institutional yes, yes, advancement. Yes, yes. And that's, that's like, wrong. What does this mean for the world? Exactly. And what can we working together do that we can't do individually? Right, right. So... Uh, but there is an international holiness convention comprised largely of, if I may say it, splinter Methodist denominations, uh, which met recently and had 5,000 people in attendance. Hmm. So the, the interest in holiness is not dead. But what was for so long described as the holiness movement, I don't think exists. That's helpful. That's a helpful distinction to make. And where else do you see some signs of hope in this? Well, I think, frankly, the collapse of Western civilization is an okay. opportunity for awesome. us. With, with people whose lives are just in absolute chaos and disaster— we have a word. Mm. We have a word of hope. Amen. We have a, have a word of possibility, and and I think that's our opportunity. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> it is in a in a society where everything is going very very nicely and everybody is comfortably getting fatter and richer. Uh, it's hard to hear. So what about holiness? Who cares about that? Mm. But in a society where people are broken, where they're in pieces. Mm-hmm. Uh, the holiness message is for us. Amen. Amen. And, and I'm thankful, you know, that you've still in, you're still investing time. The reason you're here today is because you're here for a uh, board meeting at Wesley Biblical Seminary, and that's where we aren't directly connected to uh, any of the institutions of the holiness movement. Good. In the sense that we're not we're not dependent upon. Good. You know, we have relationships yes. with various denominations. Yes. But we're in non-denominational exactly. school. Hope, hoping to speak into this world. Yes. And what's so interesting to me is that we have students who come to us, not from any of the holiness or Methodist circles that we've been a part of, but they come, and what is it that they get inspired by? The message. Exactly, and exactly. So I'm, 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 I look at even the, uh, the prominence in, in Asbury Seminary, but, but West Bethel Seminary, we've septupled in size in four years. Like, this is a sign that something in this world that's falling apart where truth isn't absolute, where people are longing for this, maybe they're, they're finding some of that here. My first message when I became interim president here at the seminary was, why should Wesley Biblical Seminary exist? Okay. And my answer is because there are very, very few other seminaries that are committed to two things, the inerrancy of Scripture. Yeah and the glory of holiness. Mm. Those two foundations. Our hope is in the word. Right, right. If we lose the word, we might as well go home. We might as well go find some drugs and <laughs> burn our heads out. And Because there's nothing. Right. If there's no word, there's nothing. 
And what does the word tell us? The word says you can share the character of God. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Okay, we'll, st- we'll finish here. One last question. It's an easy one, I think. The title of my podcast is More to the Story. Is there more to the story than is typically told of John Oswald? Is there something you'd like to do, like scuba dive or something? <laughs> I'm a model railroader. Really? Yes. In my basement is a uh, uh, pretty good-sized model railroad layout. Okay. How long have you been doing that? 60 years. Wow. So when you finish up like uh, translating a passage in Isaiah and work in the NLT, you go down and work on your railroad? Yep. Okay. Fun. So do, do you like to actually ride on trains too? Is that oh, yeah. That? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a train nut. Okay. I love it. Well, thanks so much for joining me on today's podcast. It's been such a blessing to be able to spend some time with you. Happy to do it. And thanks, everybody, for coming along. If you wouldn't mind sharing a link to this, liking this, letting people know, I'm sure that you've heard, some of you have heard Dr. Oswald before, and you didn't know some of these things about some of his scholarship and the work that God's called him to do. So in, if, you, if you don't mind, share a link to this. This would be a, a great blessing. It helps this word get out more. And check out at my, at my website, Andy Miller III, andymillerii.com, to get that resource, Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching. God bless you. Thank you.